to uh, to go over our Sunday school lesson. Amen. Most gracious Father, we come to you right now just to say thank you. Thank you for another day that you've allowed us to see. We thank you for watching over us last night as we rest and um, waking us to a new day, Heavenly Father. Uh, we, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, Heavenly Father. We thank you for blessing uh, us to be your children, Heavenly Father. We thank you for this ministry here at St. Luke, how you blessed us with a faithful pastor, Heavenly Father, for these past 40 years. We ask that you bless and strengthen him, his wife, his family, assistant pastor, St. Luke as a whole, Heavenly Father. And we thank you for the way that you challenge us. You chastise us, Heavenly Father, but at the same time comes comfort, uh, compassion, uh, counsel, all, all these different things you give us, Heavenly Father, through your Holy Spirit, through your word, and through these circumstances you allow us to come our way. So we ask that um, you empty us of ourselves today, allow your Holy Spirit to uh, illuminate our minds and our hearts, and as we um, go through your word, Heavenly Father, we first apply it that someone come forth and ask, what must I do to be saved? These things we ask in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. So, <clears throat> as you know, um, this quarter, uh, all three units, is uh, we're basically talking about courage. And uh, the title in the book is People of Valor. In this first unit, we're talking about acts of courage and how God uses uh, men and women, ordinary men and women like uh, yourself and uh, myself, to do great things. Um, and last week we looked at Joshua and how he prayed and the, the, the sun stood still Amen. and allowed them to fight the battles. And um, the same God that empowered Joshua in the Old Testament is the same God who empowers us today. Uh, today we're going to look at our brother Gideon. And um, we're going to look at this thing and uh, see what was going on back then and see how it applies to us today. Amen? Amen. But I, wanted, um, I want you to take a look at this scripture um, before we get into the book of Judges. Um, if you don't, prayerfully you have your Bibles, take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. And I want you to jot this down and keep this in mind um, as we see uh, different things unfolding today in the world and as we experience different stuff in our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verse 27. Uh, and it reads, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put shame the wise, and God has chosen weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Remember that. What the world counts as strong it's the opposite in the kingdom. Remember that. Remember that, how God works. So we took a look at that in, in the uh, first letter of Corinthians. Now let's go to the book of Judges, chapter 6. And the verses that um, the Sunday school lesson is covering uh, is verse 25 through 32. But I want to start at verse 1 in chapter 6 because you get an understanding uh, what's going on once we get to verse 25. How many know it's always good to go a little ways back and get some history? So once you get to the particular text you're looking at, you have a little understanding of what's going on. Um, so in um, chapter 6, verse 1, it said, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Midian for seven years. Notice that it said the Lord delivered them. See, you have to understand when you're a child of God, your enemies need permission from God in order to do what they do to you. Remember that. Verse 2, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites, the children of Israel, made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. The attack was so great that Israel removed themselves and hid in the mountains. Then we'll go down to verse 6. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And um, verse 7, and it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet 
to the children of Israel who said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel. And it's never forget our history. I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. Also, I said to you, I am the Lord your God. And do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But this is the key right here. And then we'll get into the Sunday school lesson. But you have not obeyed my voice. This morning in the Sunday school lesson, we find our brothers and sisters, the children of Israel, in bondage once again. Now, we know the book of Judges, we find a vicious cycle going on. There was a time of peace, and as a result, they got relaxed and forgot who was giving them the peace. And as a result, God allowed different enemies to chastise the children of Israel. And as then after they were chastised, they would cry out unto the Lord, and the Lord would send a prophet, the Lord would send a judge to rescue them. And just as soon as, because um, as we get in our lesson, if you look back the chapter before, we see Barak and Deborah that were the judges that were used. And so they enjoyed several years of peace. But what happened? They strayed. And as a result, they find themselves once again in bondage. When we look at today, as much as we complain about what's going on today, who's to say God hasn't allowed our enemies to chastise us because we have not obeyed the voice of our Lord God. Same vicious cycle going on. How many thousands of years later on? That's why I'm learning. Study your history. Understand it. Learn from our ancestors' mistakes because if we don't, we will repeat it. That is a flaw in our human character. We are creatures of habit. However, though, if we profess the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he breaks those habits. He has the power to break those cycles only if we heed his voice. So we come down at the beginning of our lesson. And it says in verse 25, And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down uh, the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that it is by. Now, basically what's going on, an angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon. Now, Gideon, it's amazing. I told uh, We see early on in chapter 6 that they, um, the children of Israel had resorted to hide in these dens and in these caves in the mountains, hiding from the, um, the Midianites, and the land was impoverished. It was a famine because the Midianites was just coming in and housing all their stuff, taking over all Israel's stuff, all this stuff that God had freely given them. So the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, but it's amazing. He was threshing some wheat. Now, usually when you thresh wheat, you do it at the top of the hill. So you can use nature, the wind, to separate the chafe from the wheat. But because of the oppression, Gideon was doing this in a wine press. A wine press is a, is a, is a, is a hole dug in the ground. And you put the grapes down in there and you mash the grapes to do the wine. Isn't it amazing? how because of disobedience, how it affects everything we do. God laid this thing out in spite of our sinful nature that I'm going, he laid it out, I'm going to give you this promised land. I want you to, 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 to be a witness to me to all these pagan nations. He gave them some rules. Don't intermarry. Don't worship their gods. 
keep, keep, keep faithful to me. But they didn't do that. And as a result, they find themselves in what was going on today. But God still has a way of revealing himself through us. So this is where Gideon comes to play. And, and, and he, he commissions Gideon. But it's amazing that it before, there, there was some preparation that had to be made. In order for God to use any of us effectively, in order for me to minister to you, in order for you to minister to me, first some things need to be removed out of my personal life. We got to get the sin out of the house. If you want to be an effective messenger of the Lord, and this is what we see right here. The angel of the Lord came to him because there was an altar in the place. There was an altar to a pagan God in the place where it should have been an altar to the almighty God. So in verse 25, the angel of the Lord is telling him, I want you to go tear down this altar. I want you to take two bullocks from your father's um, herd and sat, build, tear down the pagan altars and build altar to me and do a proper sacrifice. Verse 26, and, and, and it goes on and says, and build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock in the ordered place and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. And the grove basically is the asterisk pole. And this is God of fertility. And it's made of wood. So not only do I want you to destroy the altar, I want you to cut down this pole. And use the wood for this pole to burn this sacrifice. God is very intentional. He doesn't make any mistakes how he directs us to carry out ministry. And this is what he's telling Gideon to do. And so, verse 27, we see that Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was because he feared his father's household and then the men of the city that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. Now, I love it, verse 27, Gideon didn't try to attempt this by himself. When it comes to carrying out ministry, we can't do this by ourselves, y'all. I'm standing here before you teaching Sunday school class, but I've had a lot of help this week. Last week, leading up to the day. People have poured into my spirit all last week, encouraging me, listening, listening to other men of God, talking to my grandmother, talking to my mom. Just so many people have poured into my spirit this week. So I'm not standing up here alone. I might be by myself on this, but I'm not by myself. And so he, 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 he used these 10 men, and he did it by night. And it, it's amazing just studying the, um, the lesson and looking at this thing. Different commentators say different things. I've heard different people talk about why he did it. But actually, I think it's actually um, just studying it. It's, it's a sign of wisdom. It's a sign of wisdom. Yeah, he might have, of course, he was fearful of the backlash he was going to get. But the main thing is he did what the Lord said. Amen. Amen. That's the main thing. And see, as the Lord tells us to do stuff, do it. Now, if the Lord had directed him to do it at a particular time, then that would have put him in the situation to do that. But all the Lord told him was to tear down the altar, how, what to do with it, and then what to do. So he did that. So he was obedient. And the reason why I say that, because a lot of times we can get hung up on that he did it at night. But at the simplest form in this text, I believe it is we ought to look at the obedience that he carried out what the Lord asked him to do. He knew, he knew it was the people, but I love and I think about um, uh, Peter and John. 
um, in the book of Acts when they were before, uh, I think this is in Acts chapter either three or four after they, uh, Peter had healed the man who was begging outside the temple and they got in front of the Sahedrin and they let him know that it, it's better that we obey God than man. So even though he was fearful of what might happen to him and the people in the village, he still obeyed God. Yes, sir. And as we see, this is what got Israel in, in the predicament that they was in. And, and it's amazing. I, I, I want to Gideon, when, when the angel of the Lord first came to him, uh, verse 11, let me see, verse 13 in chapter 6. I, 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 thank you, Brother Percy, for bringing that up. Verse 13, Gideon said to him, oh, my Lord. If the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us, delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. The only thing he got right is that the Lord did deliver him in the hands of the Midianites. But the thing he got wrong, it wasn't the Lord who forsake them. It was the Israelites who forsaken the Lord. Right now, with what we're experiencing right now, the Lord has not forsaken his church. To our shame, and God, thank you for your grace and mercy, we have forsaken the Lord. To the point where he fixed it so we couldn't enjoy these great edifices that he allows us to build for his work. They, we, we, we turn our back. Like the cliche says, we bite the hand that feeds us. Yes, sir. Constantly. Yes, sir. That's true. And uh, on that note, as let's take a look at, and this is how we know that God was in what 
Gideon did. Verse 28, and when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down and the grove was cut down that was by it. And the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. Verse 29, and they said one to another, who have done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, have done this thing. Verse 30, then the men of the city said unto Joash, bring out thy son that he may die because he hath cast down the altar of Baal and because he hath cut down the grove that was by it. Now, this is confirmation. Now, here it is. They raised in Cain, and they ready to do something to him, ready to kill him. But look what happens in verse 31 in Joash, which is Gideon's daddy, said unto all stood against him, will ye plead for Baal? Will you save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death. Will it, it is yet morning? If he be a God, let him plead for himself, because one has cast down his altar. And I love it. Now here it is. Th th this altar was in Gideon's backyard. Th th this was a part of this area's routine. God chose Gideon to tear down this altar because he had something greater for him to do. But in order for you to, to, to stand for me, I need you to take down this altar first. But look how God used Gideon's father to step in front and defend his son. See how God works? See, if only we would be obedient to God, God will put some soldiers next to you. God will make sure somebody's able to speak on your behalf. Joash, Joash brought up some excellent questions. It's amazing. Who's to say that God didn't shake his thoughts? If this is such a powerful God, he should be able to defend himself. Why? Because our God sure enough can defend himself. So this Baal should be able to defend itself. And, and that's the thing we see in, in, in this history of the Israelites time and time again, even when they were in bondage in Egypt. All those plagues, all ten plagues were against the gods of the Egyptians. And all it did was show how they're nothing and the God of Israel is the real deal. Today, there's so many gods, but the God we serve continuously sets himself apart from these pagan gods in the world. He's doing it right now to this day. And for those of his children who will obey his voice, God will keep you. Not that he won't keep you from trouble, but in the midst of trouble, he'll be right there with you. The God we serve is tried and has proven himself. When are we going to learn to take God at his word? From the pulpit to the pew. Stuff looks bad. So much fighting amongst ourselves, so so much racial tension, fighting in the church, everywhere you go, it's just so much confusion. How many of you know that's just a distraction? God's still in control. He hasn't lost any power. Matter of fact, the more you look at it, it just seems like it's getting stronger. His power is stronger and stronger. All we got to do is tap into it by our obedience. That's what Gideon's doing. And it goes on to say in verse 30, 32, Therefore, on the day he called him Jerubbabel, saying, Let Baal plead against him, because he hath thrown down his altar. Changed his name. See, I love it because i seen some things as I looked at the lesson. First of all, whenever there's a circumstance in our life, a situation, we need to go to the root of the problem. And one thing that I've found is 
the root of the problem is always a sin. Whether it's mine or somebody else that's in the circumstance with myself. See, the problem is we're too busy trying to treat symptoms instead of going to the root cause. And as a result, we're, we're in this, we can be in that same vicious cycle that Israel found themselves in. It was amazing. I heard a preacher one time, and he was explaining, talking about there was a sanitarium. And uh, whenever a person felt like they was healed and they were ready to get, go, um, get released, they would do a test. They would take them in a janitor's closet. They would stop up the, the mop sink, run the water, and the water would run over. But they said the reason why they knew they weren't ready to be set free is instead of pulling the plug out of the sink, they take a mop and try to constantly mop the water that was overflowing from the sink. The same thing comes to the problem of sin. We try to treat the result and symptoms instead of going to the root of the problem. We got to get back to the basics, y'all. We got to get back to the basics. The reason why we keep on facing defeat in our lives is because we will not go to the root of the problem. Yes, sir, Bruce. It can be. Now, if I, if I confront you about an issue in love, that's not seen. You my brother, I love you. If I see something and I come to you and there's a way to come to you and I ask you and I just try to, to, to admonish you on, on, on an issue, that, that's out of love. Now, if I confront you and I'm trying to lower it over you, that, that's sinful. So there, there is a difference. The pro a lot of the problems is today, we don't want nobody to say nothing. We just want to run amok. That, that's the issue today. We've gotten to the point where we can't even rebuke each other in love. And as a result, ministry is halted. So there, there's a way to, 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 to address each other. Matter of fact, in Matthew, it tells us the proper way that we should talk amongst ourselves. And then if we can't Reconcile it, I come back and I get some godly men to go with me. And then if you don't uh, heed to that then, then we bring you before the church and handle it that way. That's biblical. Go ahead. Yes, because the righteousness that is worthy of having only comes through our relationship with God. So yes, yeah, self-righteousness is a sin. I've seen a couple of hands. Go ahead. I, that's what I said. Go ahead. Go ahead.
David had sinned against God because he slept with Bathsheba. And then he tried to cover up his sin by having her husband killed. David came forth and repented, but it was only after the prophet Nathan came to him. And then once he did, then he went and repented. And that's where we get the 51st Psalms from. Against you and you only have I sinned. So, okay. So, with that being said, you have, yes, you have to be open. But let's keep it real. David knew what he had done. And so he was at the point because he, he, he did it. He, he did accept it. But then we look in the New Testament. John the Baptist went to uh, the king and told him he ought not be messing around with his kinfolk's wife. And they cut his head off. So it, the main thing is if you're the one being confronted and you know you, you have some unrepented sin, it, you can be mad all you want. But you need to ask God for repentance. So, so there, there, there is a process. There is a way. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Amen. Obey your parents in the Lord. Amen. Amen. And so that, that, that's biblical as scripture as well. And these are the things we look at. And here's the thing because we, we talk about we are, are Gideons because he asked God to, to, to give him a sign. We talk about our, our, our Didymus, Thomas the twin, because he, he, unless I'm able to put my hand in the holes and put it in his side, I won't believe but check out Hebrews 11.32. It says, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, also of David, and Samuel, and, and the prophets. And my point is, he had faith. You say what you want about those men and those women, but they had faith. And that's what God is looking for today. Will he find us faithful when he returns? You can say what you want. We all got our, our shortcomings. But who do you put your faith in? If you don't remember nothing else about this lesson, don't let nobody steal your joy and your peace. You keep your faith in God Almighty. He'll see you through to the end. Yeah. Reverend Malone said that at Sister Terry's funeral. Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. How many want that crown of life? Remain faithful. If you don't remember nothing else about today's lesson, keep the faith. Keep the faith. Somebody lost some keys. They'll be sitting up here. Amen. Now you're in the hands of the deacons.